Hey everybody, welcome to another AFR podcast. Once again, I'm joined by Dr. Pruitt. Today we're going to be talking about some of the more frequent calls that we have within our system, uh, 25s and 32s. And there's been a recent change, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, on how these are actually even dispatched out to us in the first place. So welcome Dr. Pruitt and uh, can you Tell me what the recent changes have been, please. Sure. Um, thanks, Andrew. I'm really glad we're getting to talk about this today. I know um, it's a hot topic on everyone's mind, especially with the call volume increases over the last couple of years. Um, in August of last year, there was agreement made um, with the city where the police would be responding more to the psychiatric emergencies. Um, to the 25s and it turns out um, they had been having a lot of training and things for dealing with these emergencies and they actually have teams in place that can respond to them a little more effectively than the 911 system can so okay. that worked out in our favor and they're getting funding as well to help with that training for them that's true yes um, and um, and then in addition to that because the the police department was going to increase their responses to the psychiatric calls or the 25s. Um, reciprocally, the fire department kind of inherited and began responding to the 32 Bravos more frequently. Okay, and, and like from a city point of view, uh, can you just explain how that kind of clears up the police to do other things? Yeah, absolutely. So from the big picture point of view for the citizens of the city, it turns out the police were having to respond to the 32 Bravos as a, a basically like a priority one type of dispatch, which means that, for instance, if there was a burglary or a robbery or something going on in the same district, that burglary or robbery would take second place to them responding to a down and out on the sidewalk. Okay. So by by the 911 system taking re more responsibility for the 32 Bravos, it frees up more police officers to respond for the really the higher acuity calls in their district. Okay, so the first thing I think of, you're mentioning 32 Bravo or whatever the letter coding at the end of it is. The first thing that comes to mind is this is going to be an unknown situation. And as we're always taught, that scene safety is going to be our first priority. So definitely make sure you're paying more attention when you go to these calls. Um, however, you were explaining to me earlier the difference that there is a difference on sometimes the police will still go to those 32s. That's true. Um, as part of uh, the agreement when um, the fire department agreed to start taking these calls, safety is always a paramount concern. So um, the agreement that was reached was if this 32 Bravo is in the open, say like behind a business or at a bus stop or on a street corner, where it's generally an open area and a public place and seems safe, we can respond to that alone. But if there's a concern for maybe an enclosed space like a house or a car or any unsafe kind of situation determined by the dispatcher, that the police will still respond as well to, to ensure provider safety. All right. Um, wanted to move into talking about 32 specifically. Uh, once again, make sure the scene is safe now. A lot of the times that scene will not be cleared by police before we get there. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot for us is you have a third party, uh, excuse me, third party caller and they see somebody on the side of the road, they call it in, it usually comes up as a 32 Bravo. Um, a lot of times you show up to these patients and they are not interested in your help at all. Um, how should we deal with these, these situations? So this has become an issue as our call volume to these types of calls has increased over the last several months. Um, we, from an administrative level, are trying to evaluate creative ways to respond to those calls where we don't necessarily maybe have to send an engine or a 911 response. But in the meantime, until we get that figured out, as you guys are responding to these calls, if you show up and say it was a concerned third party caller and you talk to the person who is sitting at the bus stop and they have no apparent concerns, say they didn't call and they're not interested Taking in Taking a nap on the bus yeah, at the bench. Yeah. If they're not interested in any medical intervention, um, at that point, I would just obtain a non-patient refusal okay. and let them go on their way. So try to get a non-patient, assuming they're willing to even do that for you. But yes. again, if they're willing to, get their name, date of birth, have them sign the non-patient and be on your way. 
if they're willing to do that, I think that's probably the right thing to do. Okay. And I think that's one of the main things I wanted to touch touch on with the 32s. Now, say you show up to them and they don't have any complaints, but they seem like they're pretty heavily intoxicated or maybe uh, altered mental status due to some substance that you're not quite sure of. How do you deal with those those patients? At that point, it gets a little bit tricky. I tend to defer to kind of a a matrix of how intoxicated are they? Are they clinically sober? If they're able to get up and walk away on their own and don't have any difficulty with ambulation or they're um, sober enough to carry on a conversation with me, at that point I would think that they're sober enough to make a decision where they are able to take good care of themselves and can go on their way. If I am concerned about their ability to not walk and maybe they might stumble into traffic or end up with a life-threatening injury or even um, passed out to the point where they're at risk for aspiration or any other number of things that could go wrong, at that point, if they can't, if they can't talk or walk, then they probably do need to go to the hospital. Okay. And so normally, um, you know, you think of a 32, a lot of times it's out in public. Um, I wanted to talk about a person that is intoxicated at their own home. Say, uh, say it's a 45 year old woman who is in her own house. She drank a bottle of wine and she rolled her ankle and her husband at that point called 911 to check out the ankle. But when you get there, she appears to be pretty intoxicated. Um, but she doesn't want to go to the hospital. What do you do in a situation like that? Okay. Um, that's a good one. Um, so I think again, it would kind of come down to, um, her clinical sobriety. So, um, you have an intoxicated individual with a traumatic injury on top of it. Um, if she is able to carry on a conversation and is clinically sober, there's no law against being intoxicated in your own home. Um, she has this ankle injury, which, um, may or may not be a big deal. Um, but if she, again, if she's clinically sober, I would probably apply the same criteria to her that I would to the person on the street, Okay. which is, um, are they clinically sober? Is there an apparent life threat? And do they have the ability to understand that if they refuse to go to the hospital, this could, um, they could die. And, um, it would kind of come down to her decision-making at that point. If, uh, if she's clinically sober, I would probably let her refuse. Okay. And say the, the husband was willing to take her in. He kind of just, you know, freaked out a little bit initially. He wanted to get 911 there. And when we evaluate her, it turns out her ankle injury is not that severe. Um, say you're worried about somebody, say they're not clinically sober, but the family member or a bystander is willing to bring them into the hospital themselves. Um, does that change anything? Um, I think it would depend on the, the family member comfort level with the patient. If the patient is um, so intoxicated um, that they um, like are unresponsive, that's probably a patient that needs to go by ambulance. Um, but if they're arousable, just can't walk on their own, but can still kind of mumble or talk and the family member is comfortable with that, I think it would be okay. Okay. Um, it kind of comes down to provider comfort level again. All of these situations are incredibly gray and there's no right answer. And I think as long as providers err on the side of doing what they think is best for the patient, then you can't go wrong. Okay. Um, I forgot to mention this in the open, but we did want to touch on consent in this episode. Um, so can you tell me what the law says about consent? Consent and then forced, forced, you're talking in terms of forced transport? Correct, yes. Okay, yeah, so um, a lot of times these 32 Bravos bring up the question of, well, what um, authority do EMS have, provide, providers have to force people to go to the hospital? And really, um, I think one of the neat things about New Mexico is we have a really great respect for patient autonomy, meaning patients have the right to 
right to make decisions for themselves about their own health care. And really, sometimes what that means is patients have the right to make bad decisions. So even if we don't necessarily agree with the decisions that they're making, they can still make those in regards to their health. When we have where the state statute comes in is it um, basically says that the provider has to make a good faith decision in the best interest of the patient when they're deciding to force them. And the criteria that is um, outlined in the law is that the patient has an apparent life threat and also has the capacity to understand the risks of refusing in the setting of that life threat. So say I've actually had a phone call before where there's say a 55 year old man who's in the middle of having a massive heart attack, which is obviously an apparent life threat um, and everyone on scene would want him to go to the hospital. Um, but if he has the mental capacity at that point to understand the risks of refusing, including that he could very well die from this event, if he's okay and can verbalize that back to me and understand that that is a very real possibility, we don't have the ability to force that man to go to the hospital. Okay. And how much persuasion would you say is uh, prudent there? I, I'm sure you could try to plead with them. You could bring up that person's family. You could say, you know, whoever called about that person is really worried about you. That's why we're here in the first place. So you're going to try to talk them into it, but at what point are you going to accept that? And, and what do we do? I'm, I'm sure you're going to say, go ahead and get that patient refusal signed and then go ahead and document it fully, you know, what you did and explain to the patient. Yeah, I think um, at that point, um, if I was the provider on scene, I would pull out every trick, I, not trick, but um, every possible resource that I could to try to convince this patient to go. Um, I think a lot of times in these patients that are refusing that really do have real problems that need to be addressed, I try to dig a little deeper and find out what is the root of them not wanting to go. It might be I've seen veterans before having a heart attack and they don't want to go because they're afraid there's going to be nobody at home to take care of their dog. Or some simple problem that's holding them back from seeking the care that they need. So anytime someone's refusing and you're really worried about them, I would dig a little deeper and see if you can't help them solve the problem that's keeping them from going. Like maybe find a neighbor to take care of the dog or or whatever their issue is. Um, I would keep keep prodding, get family involved, see if they can talk to them, um, call an MSEP, that's what we're there for. Um, use all your resources at that point if you've got a patient that you're really concerned about. And if at the end of the day you've done all you can to try to convince this patient, they still have the right to refuse, but at least I think um, your conscience would be clear that you did yeah. your best. And people have a, quite a bit of respect for doctors. I know some really stubborn individuals who you know, say uh, older family members, they won't listen to anything we say, but they'll go to the doctor and say, oh, my doctor told me I need to stop eating so much sugar. And because the doctor said so, now now they're gonna follow that advice. So people do have quite a bit of respect for doctors. So calling an MSEP on scene, getting that doc to talk to the patient can be pretty helpful. Yeah, hopefully we're there as a resource for you guys. It's kind of funny because what you said is true, but really a lot of times on those phone calls, I'm not saying anything different than what you've already said. Right. So it just comes with... It just comes with, yeah, more you know respect for that position. And um, a lot of times, just like you said, this exact same words coming out of my mouth, but then the doctor on the phone telling them the same thing uh, we'll convince that person to go into the hospital. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully that clears up uh, any questions about consent. Um, another one where that forced transport comes up a lot is uh, 25. So this is going to be a psych call. It could be something pretty simple. Again, we're speaking about third party callers. It could be somebody who's just acting strange on the corner. Um, so a third party calls about somebody acting strange on the corner and now you show up to this person. You're trying to decide if they have that capacity to um, make a good decision and then what kind of risk are they putting themselves in. So can you talk about a scenario like that for a moment? Yeah, psychiatric patients can be kind of tricky. Um, 
again, this is where IMSEP might come in handy. I think some things to fall back on are always your good faith judgment of whether or not this patient has a life threat or is a risk to themselves or others is kind of always the baseline. And what are some risks that, I mean, I can think of if they're on the corner, there's going to be traffic, they might not look both ways, you know, before they're running through the middle of the street. Um, any kind of other risks that you can think of? Um, so that's definitely one where if they're just so intoxicated, they're not aware of their surroundings and are at risk of stumbling into the street and getting hit by a car. Um, some other more subtle ones might be your decompensated, like schizophrenic, say, who um, is basically to the point where they're not thinking coherently, not able to carry on a conversation, or having racing thoughts, paranoid delusions, um, and so preoccupied with whatever voices or things are going on in their mind that they're not able to um, take care of themselves and accomplish just the normal daily things like feeding themselves or bathing themselves or basic self-care. Okay. Now say the decision is made to force that person into the hospital. What would you think is the best way to actually go about that forced transport? Um, say the patient is not wanting to go. Right. And it's this schizophrenic patient that you're speaking of that's um, having delusions. Yeah, if they are to the point where they just are um, so decompensated that they can't understand anything around them, it's impossible to carry on a conversation, um, that's a person that will likely need to be forced to go to the hospital. Always with any patient that we're forcing, it's best to start with verbal de-escalation and try to reason with them. A lot of times with these patients, it's going to end up um, with either physical restraints or chemical restraints as necessary. Um, one resource that we do have, if it's kind of a gray area, a lot of these psychiatric patients are kind of gray. Um, the police, as part of their um, funding, along with the county, have created uh, mobile crisis teams, which I think are a fantastic resource for the city and for 911, and they really are great for these psychiatric patients. Um, there's six of the teams right now, and they each team consists of one police officer and one licensed behavioral health therapist, and they actually respond to scenes. So if you ever are with a psychiatric patient that you're not really sure what to do or if the ER is even the right answer for them, if they clearly just have a psychiatric problem and need psychiatric help, um, this team is someone I would think of pretty quickly to call. Okay. Um, they're easy to get a hold of through police dispatch. They'll come right to the scene and they have the ability with the therapist there to do an on-site psychiatric evaluation of the patient and they can actually make the determination whether or not this patient needs to go to a psychiatric facility right now or whether it's a low acuity enough psychiatric emergency where they're safe to stay in their own home, but maybe see a therapist the next day or get some case management or a whole lot of other social resources that that therapist has access to that we don't necessarily have from the 911 system. Okay. So that, again, if there's somewhat of a gray area, um, I can remember a patient that doesn't seem too gray. We got dispatched out to Hotel Chaco and there was a woman, it was... 11 p.m. say and she was just walking around the parking lot there um, kind of the staff at the hotel noticed her and we got called out so we showed up and said you know how's it going what's the problem today and she didn't have any complaints she was just waiting on Oprah to come out of the hotel and because she's gonna meet up with her so this patient really obviously Oprah's not coming to meet her but in my opinion, there was nothing else wrong with her at the time. How do we deal with somebody like that? Yeah, so um, so it's not illegal to be a little crazy, right? Um, so with that patient, if, if you come up to her and you don't see any apparent life threats and she's got no complaints, and otherwise, if she's just fixated on this Oprah thing, but otherwise she can carry on a conversation with you, she seems to be well taken care of, well groomed. You've got no concerns for her personal safety at this point. I agree. I don't. I don't think this is a medical or even necessarily a psychiatric emergency. Um, that call, I, I believe, you know, one of our concerns was it was eleven o'clock at night. Where are you going? Where do you live? Are you going to be able to make it 
um, home. So I think what happened on that one was we felt like she didn't need to go to the ER, but we needed to get her back where she lives. So she was able to give us her address and a police officer drove her to her house. And that's a decision that we ended up going with on that patient. That's fantastic. Uh, I love the fact that you guys like um, still cared about her. Like she didn't have an acute emergency where she needed to go to the hospital, but she did what was right for her by getting her off the streets and getting her somewhere safe that night. And um utilized all your resources. I think that's a great solution to that problem. Okay. Um, going back to the forcing transport, it seems like our attitudes have changed, you know, since I've been in probably within the last four years or so, there's been a increased use of Versed to, um, as a chemical restraint. And in my opinion, it's really kind of the way to handle some of these situations. You're going to take somebody against their will who might be on drugs. Uh, You might not even know what their vital signs are at this point because they're, you say, could I please take your blood pressure? And they just don't respond to you. So in that situation, um, usually it it has worked out for me at least pretty well that if you just give them some I am versed, you're gonna have to have a, say a police officer or somebody hold them down so you're able to administer it. But it facilitates patient, patient treatment and assessment you know before that they're just doing something really strange in a public place and you're not sure what's going on you don't know what drugs they took if they took any Um, and there's really nothing you can do until you are able to chemically restrain that person and now most of the time once that happens you finally do get a heart rate and they're going to be you know in the 140s and um, I think it's really just a better outcome for them. So can you talk about that versus, say, just a physically restraining somebody? Yeah. Um, I think at this point we're talking about a patient you've already decided in your good faith decision making that they do have an apparent life threat and they need to be evaluated. So you're already headed down the forced transport road at that point. And they're um, not answering our and, questions. You know, you, you're trying to talk to them and they're just pacing back and forth and they're, they're not... Uh, engaging you in any kind of conversation. So yeah. you're attempting to establish their their state of mind, but you know, yeah, it's not hard. successful. It's hard to do. And then it, um, I think at that point, always first and foremost on everybody's mind, and I know for me, I want my providers to be safe. Um, and if this is a patient that's prone to agitation or violence or anything else with whatever substances they have on board, and we're concerned enough um, about their safety that we've decided they do need to be evaluated. I think um, chemical restraints provide a safe way to do that if if, um, verbal de-escalation techniques have failed. And a lot of times it is safer for the patient. I mean, any medication comes with side effects and potential side effects, Um, but when you're talking about um, physically restraining a patient as well, there's risks with that too. Yeah. And we're not fighting with patients again, everybody listening. That's not our job, you know, and in my opinion, that's up to the police officers. If you decide to go that route, it's not our job to be, um, putting our hands on people. So I would leave that to the police, let them, you know, tell them what the plan is. Hey, we need you to hold them down and we're going to, we're going to give them some Versed. Um, so I am. Yeah, I think that's totally the right approach if it's reached that point um, so that we can continue our assessment and get them the care that they need. Because you're right, usually by the time you do get them to a point where you can evaluate them, their vital signs are usually completely out of whack and they they are potentially in danger of either dehydration or rhabdo or any other number of possible life-threatening emergencies that need to be treated. All right. <laughs> Moving on to, I wanted to bring up a, Another 25 that's come up quite a bit is you go on to a suicidal patient and there's kind of some he said, she said going on there. Um, Say a girlfriend or boyfriend says this person made a suicidal statement. You show up to the scene and this person is not admitting it to you. Uh, It puts you in a little bit of a tricky situation because if they are suicidal, now that's a, a life threat and you can't leave that person alone because you know as soon as you leave they could just kill themselves however if this is you know everybody may have had a crazy boyfriend or girlfriend out there and somebody could just lie about this statement and uh, so it really puts you in a, a tough spot can you talk about a situation like that these are uh really difficult calls and they do come up fairly frequently um 
of course, calling INSEP is always a good option here, but really the best option, I think, is those mobile crisis teams that we talked about earlier. Um, the fact that there's actually a behavioral health clinician who can come to the scene and evaluate this patient right there on scene will save time for everybody. It's the appropriate treatment at the appropriate time with an appropriate decision maker to help sort out all the details of the situation. Um, a lot of times in the past, I think prior to these teams, I know personally, if there was any question of suicide, I would err on the side of forcing that patient to go to the hospital to be evaluated. But really, when you take a step back and look at it, the emergency department isn't necessarily the right place for that patient either. Even if they were suicidal and the, the um, partner was right, um, in the ED, they usually sit there, they get their blood drawn, they're there for hours, they're missing work, they're up all night, and then they may or may not um, get an evaluation by a psychiatrist, which will take hours and probably make that patient situation even worse by their lost sleep, their lost time, their maybe missing work, and it's just compounding whatever is making them depressed in the first place. And it's not really the right solution for anybody. Um, and by having the MCT teams come to the come to the scene and evaluate that patient there and make that decision, it makes everybody's life a lot easier, and I think it's better for the patient. And what are some options now on these 25s? Again, the, the police are going to be going to a lot of these. They're getting specialized training. They're getting more funding. What would that call look like now? Because there's a lot of us that have, you know, we've we spent a lot of time going on 25s, and we're used to most of the time we take them into the hospital. What could that scene look like now with the police being involved? Now with the police there, they are more and more aware of these teams existing. So the teams can actually take the patient to the hospital themselves, to the psychiatric hospital, if they deem that that's necessary. If not, the teams also have the ability to clear everybody else from the scene and let the patient stay there. Um, the question and the confrontation, I've seen a couple of these where if there is a medical component to the psychiatric emergency, say the patient is having anxiety, but they're also complaining of shortness of breath and chest pain, or um, the patient was suicidal and might have cut their wrist, even if it's even if it's shallow, that patient still has a medical component to their emergency and will need to go to the ER to be evaluated before their psychiatric evaluation can be complete. Okay. Um, one last thing we wanted to talk about prior to wrapping it up is there's some future de developments going along with these uh, two kind of calls we've been talking about. So again, with the 25s and 32s, I believe you were telling me there's going to be a MATS expansion coming in that's, the future. That's right. Um, I think it's it's no secret that um, public inebriates have been um, quite a burden on our 911 system and our call volume to these um, down and out calls just keeps going up. And it's uh, more of a public health emergency in my mind than a 911 type of emergency. And as we're looking at the way forward to more creatively and appropriately address these emergencies, one of the things that um, has been actually proposed through the county and they've been collecting taxes on for the last four years is finally probably going to come to fruition this summer where the Matt's campus is actually really substantially expanding their capabilities to receive patients. There's, there's two phases to it. The first phase will be the kind of the intake area where they're going to actually place medical providers there that work under medical direction. So I think Right now, the idea is either to have a paramedic or an EMT intermediate there that can act under doctor's orders to um, take patients whose vital signs might have a little wider range or um, even administer maybe some um, withdrawal medications like Valium or Versed or fluids or simple medications under a protocol to keep more patients there rather than kicking them to the hospital. And that, um, that front piece will have a little bit more of a medical component to hopefully expand their capabilities to take more of the public inebriates there and keep them out of 911. On the back side, if those patients can make it through the first 23 hours in that triage area, there's an entire um, remodification of the 
um, longer term capabilities than that, it's where they have primary care providers, psychiatric providers, substance abuse providers, case managers, all working as a team for these patients to holistically treat all of the patients' um, needs or issues. Because we all know a lot of these patients, they don't just have one problem. A lot of times um, there might be some substance abuse, but there's also psychiatric illness as well as homelessness or whatever social factors are contributing. And that um, back half will be able to address all of those concerns at once for the patient to hopefully get them the help that they need and a little bit more of a stable living situation. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. So hopefully that'll be coming this summer. Okay. Any other any other future plans? <laughs> I think uh, there is a lot of planning right now. Everyone is well aware of the increases in call volume and the um, burden of responding to the down and outs. And there's a lot of ongoing discussions at um, high levels around the city and the EMS system as a whole to creatively respond to these lower acuity 911 calls. Okay, so it sounds like uh, more to come, still kind of figuring out what the best plan for it is. Yeah, I think, uh, I know it's a little frustrating to be out on the streets right now, constantly going to a bus stop and finding a patient that's not interested in medical care or even not finding a patient at all sometimes. Um, but just know that um, people are looking into it and trying to creatively figure out a, a plan to address it, but wanting to be deliberate about it. And um, address it in the most effective way possible. I know we're looking at a lot of other cities, the way that other cities have responded to this problem too, because we're not we're not alone in having a public inebriate problem. Mm. I know um, San Diego, Seattle, San Francisco, Denver, all have had similar problems and all have different ways of addressing. Um, their EMS response to the public inebriates. And so we're looking at all the different systems out there and trying to figure out which one would work best here in our city. And then also putting a little, of our, a little bit of our own like creative thought process into yeah. it as well. Right. We'll look forward to seeing what we come up with. And I'm sure as soon as we have that, it'll get rolled out to the field. Dr. Pruitt, once again, I'd like to thank you for coming on and thank you everybody for listening. I'll talk to you on the next episode. Thanks, Andrew.